So, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Davide De Biasio, and I am a member of the ISQG Outreach Activity Team. Today, I will have the great pleasure of discussing quantum gravity with Professor Eric Verlinde. After having defended his PhD thesis at Utrecht University, he moved between various institutions and ended up gaining a, and ended up gaining a full professorship from Amsterdam University. Thank you very much for having accepted our invitation, Professor Berlinde. Thank you. Well, pleased to be here. That's great. So uh, your research career led you to work among various other things on uh, string theory, uh, more mathematical aspects of conformal field theories, holography, and a possible entropic uh, slash emergent origin of gravity. We'll get into that uh, later. Would you mind uh, expanding a bit on yourself, your career, your research interests, as you please? Well, from, yeah, students on, I mean, when I was a student in, in physics, I was already very much interested in black holes and anything to do with gravity, and in particular, the question about quantum gravity. Uh, then it turned out that string theory was giving us lots of uh, ways of calculating things. Eventually, we understood uh, more about black holes and so on. But my, my ultimate goal always has been to understand better uh, the origins of gravity and also what its relation is with with what we are seeing in black holes like like where where uh, things can appear from black holes there's something associated to the entropy of black holes so that question i think for me was always very early on on my uh, well list of interests and that came actually from uh, documentaries that i watched uh, as a teenager where hawking was explaining his ideas about hawking radiation but also, uh, yeah, my my uh, one of my thesis advisors, uh, Gerard at Hoofd, actually uh, he was already explaining the importance of uh, having to quantize uh, gravity and and understand what what happens really at the Planck scale, and so those questions have motivated me from the beginning. And I was actually very lucky that when I started doing my PhD, that that string theory was just appearing as sort of the most promising candidate to sort to answer those questions. I think we eventually learned a lot more, uh, which I will hope to explain later than uh, while well related to black holes and all that stuff. But that have, has always been my, my main interests. And I, I think I'm lucky that I have been able to work on that as well in my career. That's simply great. So. Uh, you mentioned gravity. You and I mentioned gravity quite a few times uh, <laughs> in the last minutes. So I guess it might make sense, being our audience quite, you know, uh, vast, uh, perhaps, and there will be many different people listening to us. So it might make sense now to try to characterize this problem of quantum gravity a bit better in a broader sense and clearer sense before starting with your specific research interests. So how would you discuss the problem of quantum gravity? Why is it important? Why is it hard? Why is it not as simple as quantizing the electromagnetic field, for example? Well, what we learned actually already from the very beginning is that gravity is universal. Anything that we have in, in the universe that carries some kind of energy feels the force of gravity. Also, what Einstein showed is that that gravity or the gravitational force is ultimately and intimately connected to the geometry of space and time. So we're not just talk, just talking about gravity. We're also talking about what space and time are and and what how you should think about them. And and in quantum gravity, we are interested really in in uh, well the most underlying sort of the microscopic origins of these things because quantum gravity of quantum mechanics actually first is about tiny objects. That's how we learned it. I mean, in, in molecules and, and, and atoms, we have building blocks like the electrons, the protons, and they, they, they well, work together in a quantum mechanical way. And so uh, ultimately, we like to have one theory of nature that describes this quantum world together with uh, the, the world of gravitation and, and in particular, indeed, uh, how space and time and, and its geometry are described in this quantum mechanical language. And uh, somehow we discovered that, that um, while well, black holes are particularly uh, interesting objects to study in this question, in this regard, because they, they um, reveal more about what this underlying 
microscopic description uh, might be. Uh, and the other approach that I studied a lot is this idea of um, string theory, where indeed what we notice is that uh, what, why was quantum gravity hard it had to do with when we did our calculations using more conventional ideas like that particles, the elementary particles are really point-like, that we would run into all kinds of difficulties. I mean, the, the problem of quantum gravity is that the calculations that you do naively sometimes give you infinite answers which don't make sense. We'd like to uh, understand actually, of course, our world in a way where we can calculate and get finite answers and even, well, uh, um, yeah, have, have a microscopic theory from which we can then calculate those, uh, those quantities. Okay, so to summarize, uh, on one hand, we have general relativity, uh, which taught us that gravity and space-time have a lot to do with each other. On the other, we have quantum mechanics that kind of uh, could be defined as a language in which we write all the microscopic interactions in a word. And it's really hard to merge the two. And there are various options, various directions. Do you agree with this brief summary I made? Yeah, that is kind of where the, where the heart of the problem lies. That's correct. Perfect, perfect. Uh, so, but in this whole business of quantum gravity, you mentioned black holes a few times. So, uh, and since black holes kind of offer us a natural way to enter the, the topic of holography and then of all other nice things we'll discuss today, would you like to uh, briefly comment on black holes? What are black holes? Why are they, well, before what they are and then why they're important in the context of quantum gravity? Okay, so, so black holes are, are the objects in, in, in the universe where most uh, well, gravity is the strongest. I mean, gravity pulls things together. Yes. And it may happen that, that the gravitational pull is so strong that all the matter that we have can be sort of pulled together into regions of space where, um, well, the gravity is so strong that even light cannot escape because uh, gravity affects everything that I've said. Uh, I mean, even light is being a curved by by gravity and it can actually be captured by the gravitational field and that what happens with the black hole is that there's some uh, if there's a black hole sitting somewhere there's some imaginary sphere that you can uh, draw around it where if you go beyond uh, the the surface of that sphere then you're inside the black hole and then even light cannot escape so there's no way that a signal from inside the black hole would be able to reach us and this is why they're also called black, because there's no light coming from them. But this sphere around them, we call the horizon. Uh, I think nowadays people have, uh, well, heard a lot in the, in, in the news about maybe even pictures that we have taken of, of black holes, where we almost can see the horizon. It's th this uh, image of a black hole that, that also... Um, well, that we study actually also using the more theoretical methods because this horizon is really what, what a lot of puzzles about black holes are about. Uh, black holes, um, for instance, cannot, um, well, just release, the mass cannot escape from them. And so there's always, when two black holes, for instance, meet each other, they will always make a bigger black hole. So the horizon somehow is always increasing in size. And, and this is what what made us also pos uh, well think about what is the interpretation of the area of that horizon, and this is where the connection with 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 um, holography comes in because um, somehow we we have realized that the amount of um, well what you can throw into a black hole I mean there's some entropy or some information that you can associate it with that that somehow that this horizon is a way of measuring actually how much we have actually thrown into the black hole. Uh, it's somewhat like, like what we know namely in, in thermodynamics is that entropy also always increases. And, and so this increase of the horizon area is kind of the analog of what happens in thermodynamics that entropy always uh, increases. And, and that makes a very, uh, well, interesting connection between the laws of thermodynamics and the laws of gravity, which is, I think is, is one of the bigger discoveries that came out of the work of, of uh, uh, Hawking and, and others. Well, uh, in this sense, let me please stress you one point for everyone who's listening to us. Uh, the, the fact that nothing can escape, escape a black hole, you mentioned light, but 
it's important to stress that uh, special relativity teaches us that nothing can exceed locally <laughs> the speed of life or, or of light. Well, nice <laughs> slip of light in a vacuum. So that's the point. If light cannot escape black holes, nothing, no signal, as you said, can escape black holes. And you use this word holography to refer to the area of the black hole, right? So uh, when when you say uh, holography, you, you, you really mean that physics, black hole physics should be characterized by some theory, something living on its horizon instead. Because we usually, like naively, let me uh, play the role of uh, the street man, right? But naively, I would expect black holes to be characterized as any other object by, what, by what's inside them. But clearly, nothing inside a black hole can communicate with its border, right? With its event horizon. So what you mean is that physics of black holes can be, in a sense, reduced to their horizons, at least at first, approximately at three level. <laughs> yeah, well, so one of the important things you have to uh, also note is that, that when um, things fall into a black hole is that, that even clocks start behaving differently. So when we look from the outside, we, we see basically that the person or something that falls into the black hole almost stops and, and, and stays at the horizon. So you never really cross the horizon. So from our outside perspective, the horizon is the end of the world. And, and there's nothing that we need to sort of talk about what's inside the black hole. And indeed, we cannot communicate with that. Uh, the other lesson that we learn is that if you take a certain region of space and, and you want to sort of put more a matter inside that there's a limit in how much matter you can put in namely at some moment when you start putting more inside it starts forming a black hole and that made us think about what is the amount of information that we need to describe uh, anything inside a certain volume uh, it turns out that that the most well when i want to put in, things inside like well books, uh, other things that, that carry information, the maximum amount that I can put in is exactly when I start putting so much well, matter and books and information inside that they start forming a black hole. And so then the amount of information is exactly given by kind of the area of its horizon, mm -hmm. which is then sort of the boundary of that volume of space that I was considering. So we have sort of a way in, in which we think about describing a part of space, for instance, like the inside of a black hole, as having uh, all of its information sort of uh, put or sort of, I would say, projected onto the, the, the surface of its, well, the ball that, that is containing it. This is what, what looks like a hologram, because for a hologram, you're also having a two-dimensional picture from which you try to sort of reconstruct a three-dimensional image. So all the information is on a two-dimensional hologram, but the actual thing you're describing is three-dimensional. And so this is also happens then, probably what's happening in, in black holes, that's our current theories, is that, that you describe everything, what's inside basically by a theory that lives on the, on the, on the boundary of that, that, that region. And this is called holography. And, and it certainly has been uh, one of the main ideas that many of our, our colleagues have been working on, including also myself, uh, namely that, that indeed in a theory of quantum gravity, kind of the information of what you need to describe what's going on in a space-time kind of lift, lifts on its boundary uh, like a hologram. Okay. Okay, so uh, you use the word information, right, quite a lot, and which in physics is kind of related to the notion of entropy, which you uh, mentioned before. But uh, imagining, you know, a bachelor student or a high school, particularly interested high school student who encountered the concept of entropy, maybe in thermodynamics, and that guy should be quite surprised by by listening this, like uh, listening the word, listening to the word, like hearing the word entropy in the context of black holes. Because usually, when we uh, use the word entropy, we refer to gases, right, or thermodynamical That's systems. Right. Yeah. And what does entropy have to do? I mean, you uh, kind of. Uh, already set up the stage for this parallel between the black hole area and the notion of entropy, but. In general, shall we define entropy 
before moving to to more like what is entropy in the end in a general sense so what is entropy so one way i i, I think about it and it's certainly the way we also describe it um i mean so entropy is of course a quantity we introduce in in, in the laws of thermodynamics but the laws of thermodynamics can be understood statistically as describing, uh, well, being even derived from, from the microscopic laws that control the molecules and, and the things that are, are making up gas. So if you think about gases or fluids, the notion of entropy has to do with, with how many possible ways can all the gas molecules move. And, and there's some way in which we can count the possible uh, um, well, the possibilities for all these positions, for instance, all the velocities of molecules in terms of what is called entropy. It's basically the microscopic um, possibilities of all the uh, motions. So if I think about entropy uh, in, in, for instance, a gas in a room, uh, the fact that the, the gas is sort of distributed equally over the entire room is also because it tries to maximize its entropy. If I would take all the mo gas molecules and put it in one corner of the room, that's not a maximal entropy, but it's also not because I need much less information also to describe it. So the link between information and entropy is, is actually saying, well, microscopically, there's a certain amount of information that I can associate with the positions and, and the velocities by basically telling you for every particle what is their position, what is their velocity, and, and I need a lot of data. I mean, it's, if you think about a computer on which you have to store that information, you need many bytes and many megabytes or gigabytes. And, and actually, the, this idea of counting entropy in terms of information is actually goes back to Shannon who indeed showed that if you think about the number of bits or bytes that you need to describe, describe say, where all these molecules are, if you count them, that would be a very good way of defining the entropy of that, uh, that system. Object. And so with, with uh, black holes, actually, the, the way that we start understanding why there was an entropy associated with them was actually a thought experiment. Um, because in, in laws of thermodynamics, we know that entropy always increases. And it was actually John Wheeler that asked the question, if I have a, a, uh, a box with a certain amount of gas in it, and it has a certain amount of entropy, and I try to hide from you that I have this entropy, yes. um, can I, if I throw it into a black hole, uh, how do you know where the entropy has been? I mean, and, and can I still recover the fact that the entropy has to increase? For instance, if you have uh, a cup which you fall, then of course the entropy is larger than when it's still a, a full uh, cup. I mean, you can break things and then the entropy increases. That's one way to think about it. But if I try to hide that by throwing it into a black hole, you would not have known what I have done to it. And so there's some way that we have to start um, saving almost the, the, the laws of thermodynamics when we ha are dealing with black holes. And, and it was Bekenstein who discovered that in order to make sure that entropy always increases, that we have to associate an entropy to the black hole that is given by the area of its horizon. Because in that way, any entropy that I try to hide by throwing things into the black hole will then be recovered from, by looking at, at the size of, its, of the horizon. Okay, so this is some kind of photo experiment, right? You have entropy which more or less roughly counts the number of distinct micro configurations that give a particular macro like big <laughs> from a big human perspective configuration and you know that this thing this entropy must increase it is related to information as you said but when you have a black hole and you throw something in entropy seems to be destroyed or hidden at least from an outside observer. And since the only thing that happens is that the black hole grows, you must associate this entropy growth, recover this entropy growth, associating an entropy to the area of the black hole. Is this correct? That's it, correct. That's the way. way. Yes. So you have this nice parallel, right? Between, as you said, areas that only increase, entropies that only increase. So there seems to be an interplay between black holes and thermodynamics. Does this suggest in some sense, at least at a speculative level, that 
black holes might be thermodynamical systems, like compo in the same sense of gases. Or that's right. I mean, that's true, and that is kind of what was uh, studied by by Bekenstein, and then directly after that, Hawking came around because he said, "Well, if if black holes have entropy, I mean every thermodynamic system that we know about that has entropy also has a temperature, because mm -hmm. that's well what thermodynamics is about. It's about how hot objects. So what." The, the the really surprising discovery was of of um, uh, Hawking was that if you include quantum mechanics, then you discover that black holes indeed have a temperature. There's a certain way that the quantum uncertainty allows, namely, uh, particles uh, to be sort of well created by quantum fluctuations. Um, and and the way they, that happens in the vacuum is that you have a particle and an antiparticle that can exist for a very short time. But then if they annihilate again, there's nothing wrong because then you, well, you don't see them. But for black holes, in the neighborhood of black holes, something uh, well special can happen. Namely, one of the two particles falls into the black hole, the other one can escape. And that was what uh, Hawking calculated. And then he discovered that black holes actually emit thermal radiation with a temperature that we now call the Hawking temperature. And then if you wind down the the law that tells you that indeed the horizon area would increase if I throw something into the black hole, that law starts looking exactly like also the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, namely how? I mean, um, the mass of the black hole, if you think about it, uh, Einstein showed that energy and mass are, are um, proportional, and so E equals mc squared. So the mass of the black hole, you can think about sort of as the energy of the system, and then one of the laws of thermodynamics tells you that if you increase the energy, there's also an increase in entropy uh, and the proportionality constant is given by the temperature. And, and, and Hawking showed that exactly black holes have the same uh, property, that if I throw something into the black hole, I'm increasing its energy. And then the increase in the area of the, of the horizon is exactly given by, well, um, the change in energy times the Hawking temperature. And so you find that the, the laws of, of gravity and how, how they tell you how the size of a black hole increases if you throw a mass in, exactly takes the form of the laws of uh, thermodynamics. The okay. same the same equation. So if you have on one side a black hole and on the other a thermodynamical system and you associate the mass of the black hole to the energy, the black hole area plus up to some constant to the entropy and the temperature to the temperature, like we discovered the black holes have temperature, you find some laws for black holes that look like thermodynamics laws. Is that correct? Yes, they, they don't only look like they're identically the same. I mean, there's no difference between them. And I, I think that is a really uh, important discovery that was as has made by, by Hawking and collaborators. Uh, I mean, there's uh, Bekenstein and 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 many people kind of involved. But what it tells us is that something really fundamental about about gravity and its connection with quantum mechanics, because for the laws of thermodynamics, we now know that they can be derived. They can be derived from a a microscopic understanding of how molecules work and how how um, atoms move. And by, by looking at them statistically, I can uh, derive the laws of thermodynamics. For instance, the, the, the temperature you can think about as sort of the, the average energy per uh, atom or something like that. And, and uh, as I already explained, the entropy is something that's associated to the number of microscopic possibilities that these molecules and atoms can, can be in. And of course, we know what, what energy means. And actually, in the case of black holes, the energy is directly, as I said, related to the mass. So the only other two things we, we need to then explain is sort of what is the really, um, well, can we explain, for instance, what is this entropy that black holes are carrying? Can we derive maybe the same laws in the same way that we derive the laws of thermodynamics? But now we can then derive the laws of gravity. Uh, and this is kind of what, where we can are at now, is that I do think that there are ways where we can try to ma make the analogy much more precise. It's not just they look the same. They really are the same if you think about it in the right microscopic language. So there's a strong hint of this correspondence or identity between 
black hole mechanics laws and laws of thermodynamics. Uh, first question, let me start from the very beginning. Uh, clearly, you would you do not expect uh, these properties only to apply to black holes, right? Black holes are made of space-time in the end, at least horizons, right, in some sense. So this would be more general than black holes, right? This would apply to space-time as a whole, any possible configuration. Is this correct? Like, we are not only talking about black holes. Oh. Strictly speaking, so black holes, uh, as a, yeah, they, they they're so nice because they they focus us on these problems and they they exhibit this property that the horizon tells us about the amount of information that behind, or well, inside the black hole, uh, but horizons can can also occur in other spaces, uh, other places, and and as you say, you're right that that what we're learning is not just um, well what, what gravity is made of or what black holes are made of. We're actually learning about what space time is is made of because what are the analog of these these molecules or, or the atoms for thermodynamics for the case of, of black holes it's not so clear it's not the particles that we have in nature there's some more well more microscopic building blocks that we have to look for of space time itself um, so one of the things that we learned is that uh, there are indeed other places where we can have horizons which has to do with a special property also of, of gravity. I mean, if gravitation, uh, well, normally we think about it that, that things fall and they have a certain acceleration by which things fall. But the force that we are feeling can be, well, in the same way kind of described by uh, going to another place in space where we can start accelerating. If we accelerate, we actually also feel a force. And it turns out that if you keep accelerating, you actually also create kind of a horizon because the way that you uh, keep accelerating, there is actually eventually a part of space where if light would travel towards you, uh, it will never reach you because you keep accelerating away. And those horizons turn out to have very similar properties as black hole horizons. Even they have a temperature mm -hmm. that's proportional to the acceleration by which you're accelerating. And, and that is one of the more the other more fundamental um, laws that were found. And actually, if you think about Hawking's calculation, it was later indeed refined by Unruh. And he discovered that the same formula can be obtained by indeed taking the temperature to be proportional to the acceleration, mm -hmm. uh, which we now call the Unruh temperature. And that applies not just near black holes, but also in other parts of space. And even in, in, in cosmology, we have horizons. Mm -hmm. Uh, which we also try to understand. Anyway, I can explain that that maybe later. Oh yes, we we will jump into that. If I may, uh, just to make it a bit uh, simpler, because uh, we have this experience, right, uh, of weight associated to acceleration. This is something all of us have in every in our everyday life. This is a straight connection because when we are in cars, in planes, in elevators, this is the historical example. We do feel like some weight associated to the acceleration of the object we are in. So there's some kind of intuitive correspondence between gravity and acceleration that was made clear and more formal in general relativity. And what you're telling us is that uh, there, this correspondence can be pushed even further in the sense that you can create horizons or at least perceive horizons when you accelerate, meaning that stuff will not reach you along your trajectory. And those uh, uh, horizons have a temperature in the same sense uh, in which at least uh, similarly to what black holes have is this does this make sense to you is yeah, this that's correct. summary yeah, that's correct. okay that's that is a good summary okay perfect perfect i'm just trying to boil everything down you know just to uh, as a brief end of the chapter thing because we are putting a lot of stuff on the table so and we have so we outline this correspondence between gravity and uh, well space time and thermodynamics and and you said that this might hint at the fundamental nature of uh, of gravity right uh, can you expand on this can we move towards your uh, proposals regarding uh, emergent and uh, entropic origin of gravity so so um well yes i mean the main so to say this, yeah, let me first explain what emergence means. I mean, for me, emergence uh, is, is the idea that, that there is uh, concepts that we use sort of at microscopic scales that, that can be explained microscopically. 
And uh, I, we already mentioned temperature. I mean, we understand temperature is something that we can feel and we can, can measure it. But if you really think what is its microscopic uh, origin, it comes from the motion of the the molecules that are hitting whatever your, your thermometer and so on. And there's a microscopic explanation of that. So temperature, I think about as an emergent uh, concept. I mean, it's something that pressure. we can associate as well. And pressure is the same thing. Pressure is also something that is only a measure of all the molecules together. And it sort of tells you that the average motion or the velocities that, that molecules are having. So something similar seems to be now uh, happening with with gravity so the equations that that einstein wrote down uh, telling us how space time is curved and 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 how it reacts to matter by by matter curving space and then well the way that matter mo moves in space time somehow we have to then find the uh, derivation of that very similar as we can derive the laws of thermodynamics mm -hmm. and and one of the um important um well, clues of course come from black holes, but more generally from horizons. And so I uh, indeed made a proposal that we should think about um, the origin of gravity indeed in the same way you think about of well the explanation of, of the laws of thermodynamics. So one of the insights that I got is that uh, when you um, look at forces, there are also forces in nature that that can be explained from from well changes in the amount of entropy. I mean, we already mentioned that if you um, um, change the energy, then there's an associated change of entropy. But there's an, also uh, situations where it goes the other way around. That if there's some way in which the entropy changes, that then as a result there is a, a force appearing. Like for instance, if I have a, a room with a gas inside of it there's some way that that uh well i can think about uh well reducing the size of the room for instance mm -hmm. then i i i'm increasing the pressure but i have to apply a force uh to do that and and that force you can actually explain by the fact that the, also there was a change in entropy because the, the amount of entropy that that got reduced or enlarged or something like that so this is also what i i propose actually for acceleration so one of the um, fundamental laws of course when you think about uh, mechanics and so on is newton's law which tells indeed that that mass is proportional to um excel the, the force is proportional to the mass and to the acceleration so there is a way in which that can even be um, derived as if it's a from a, a, a law of thermodynamics if you think about the fact that I already mentioned that the temperature was proportional to the acceleration, that is in a very important um, hint, actually, that there is uh, some fundamental relation between Newton's law and this, this temperature. And so I found a, a way of deriving Newton's law by, by thinking about the laws of thermodynamics of horizons. So if you take a horizon, it satisfies the, the laws of thermodynamics. And then you can ask, well, what does that mean if I have a particle in the neighborhood of the horizon? It's accelerating. And suppose I would, would move it a little closer to the horizon. Okay. And if that does something to the entropy, you can actually understand that there is actually a force responsible for that. And that force is actually the inertial force that's acting on that, that, uh, that mass. So the idea of emergent gravity is basically that these gravitational forces and also the way that uh, the space-time uh, well, reacts to matter can be derived in the same way as we can derive the, the laws of thermodynamics uh, from statistical physics, actually. Uh, but in this sense, would, you, would this imply that there's a fundamental difference between gravity and, for instance, as I mentioned it before, electromagnetism. Like when we quantize the electromagnetic field, we have a fundamental object. We do not strictly speaking say it's emergent in the same sense in which we say that uh, thermodynamics that is correct. Are, right. That is correct. Um, um, so I think that, that gravity, um, the way we think about um now gravity is, is special first of all it's special because it's connected to space and time 
and it because it acts on everything that has an energy and a mass and so on it's it's sort of like the same like thermodynamics also applies to everything uh while electromagnetism only uh is important for things that carry a charge if it's not carrying a charge it will not feel the electromagnetic force while uh, mass is not something that that well you can take away as a property of a particle i mean or, or energy i should say so um so i think the gravitational force is 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 a one that is as i said well directed related to space time and therefore it has a special role i think we now understand starting to understand where where uh, gravitation comes from but that i would say that if gravity is emergent eventually those other forces also should be emergent except we are not there yet in developing the theory uh, at the same level so our current description of the electromagnetic force works very well, but I don't think of it as the most fundamental description that we will eventually uh, get. So also these other forces will eventually be emergent, although not in the exact same way as gravity does. Gra gravity has this connection with thermodynamics that somehow we don't see directly with um, um, the, the electromagnetic force. But it doesn't mean that those forces will also not eventually be emergent. Um, so just to make it OK, this is super interesting. I guess it's better to stick to gravity, because I would like to ask many, many questions about what you think of other forces. But let's stick to gravity. Uh, so you say that Einstein's equations, space time itself, whatever, might have this emer emergent nature. Uh, so the natural question, just to make it real clear, is what do you expect them to emerge from? Like when you have a gas and thermodynamics laws, it's quite easy to answer this question, right? You have molecules yes. or whatever. What, what's the corresponding object in this entropic perspective on gravity? Yes. So um, we mentioned the, the, the um, connection with quantum mechanics. So we have to think about it in terms of quantum mechanics. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, we mentioned things like information. Uh, anyway, information I think about as as bits, sort of uh, zeros and ones. In quantum mechanics, things can even be weirder because then we can have things that are in between zeros and ones, uh, because things are not totally uh, well uniquely. The, uh, the outcome is not always clear. I mean, there's a certain probability you find a zero or a one. Now, with with quantum mechanics, we even have another weirder property, namely that the outcome of a measurement you do in one place of the space time influences what happens at another place, and this is namely called entanglement. So it's the fact that that if you have an object here, it might be entangled with something else. Now, in in um, in the neighborhood of black holes, uh, when we talk about these particles being created and sort of being emitted, uh, like what Hawking calculated. There's this other other particle, this antiparticle that falls into the black hole. The properties of those two particles, they are related. If one particle sort of has positive charge, the other one must have negative charge because they were created from the vacuum. If one has spin up, the other one must have spin down because they were created for the, from the vacuum. But you don't know whether the one is spin up or the other spin down. No, it can be the other way around. And in quantum mechanics, you can therefore have entanglement between those two particles. So what is really the information that we're counting is how much entanglement there is between particles on one side and on the other side. But maybe even not just particles. It's namely in quantum well, mechanics, when we do relativistic quantum mechanics, we even talk about fields. I mean, there are many things that are not really particles, and those fields cannot even be entangled inside and outside. So it's exactly out, it's in entangled quantum information. That's kind of the building block from which a space time has to emerge. So the emergence comes from and quantum entanglement of information on one side of the horizon and the other side so even in space time you may wonder well if i think uh, about say objects like a table or whatever uh, it's one object because the molecules are bound together in some some way in space time we basically have to ask the same question if i take space time and i want to cut it in half how does the right hand side of space know that it's connected to the left hand side and now we, we're basically understanding that the origin is entanglement. It's like the binding force 
that keeps space time connected. So, at the so that, that's the microscopic language in which we have to sort of now start formulating, well, the origin of space time and, and of the gravitational force. So at a fundamental level, I just wanted to remark this. You expect the universe, and there's evidence for that, we mentioned it, to be basically written in the language of entanglement between pieces of quantum information, right? This this That's is correct. the thing. Then everything emerges from that. Like the, the, so this idea goes around, right? I, I, the, it appears here and there. So it's something I'm quite interested in. I mean, there's a lot of work, right? around it but yeah it's i think by now we start seeing that this is the right language and actually i'm quite convinced that this will eventually lead us to a new theory of space time and, and the gravitational force as being emergent from an underlying theory in terms of quantum information okay so this is because often right you hear people um discussing correspondences or dualities or uh, identities between uh, space-time and uh, entanglement, entropy, or information. Here, you're really saying something stronger than that, right? They're not pieces of the same metal. You're saying that entropy and quantum information is something, a, a lower layer, a more fundamental layer with respect to space-time, right? That's correct. I, th I think the, uh, the real fundamental language is that of quantum information and space-time and the language that we use there is derived from it and is really the emergent language okay. that's only there at, at microscopic scales. Okay. And so moving towards more, because now I'm really, I'm really interested to ask a few questions, right? Uh, thank you very much for the nice explanation, by the way. It's really clear. I guess it's really clear and I'm sure it will be clear for our audience, but uh, from a technical perspective, uh, uh, which is the state of the art? How would you describe the state of the art of this perspective on quantum gravity? Like, do you manage to derive Einstein field equations? What about Newton's law? What can you do? What still has to be done? How would you outline? It? So the idea of holography came about in in sort of the, the 90s and it's people like Lenny Susskind and Gerrit at Hoofd. Uh, I already mentioned at Hoofd who basically put that forward. And then quite quickly after that, it was Ted Jacobson, another uh, physicist thinking about quantum gravity, who basically already showed that if you have a horizon somewhere in space, like he thought about also these horizons that were created by accelerated observers, okay. that if you assume that the laws of thermodynamics apply to them, you can derive Einstein's equations. So that was already done in, in, in well, mid-90s. This has been revived now in, in recent years because in string theory, you made a lot of progress as well. I, I, personally, I do think that string theory also will help us understand maybe this microscopic language in more and more precisely. I will not say too much about it, but one thing that we succeeded in doing is, first of all, explaining more microscopically what is the information associated to black holes. So this Bekenstein-Hawking formula for entropy of black holes given by the area was kind of reproduced for black holes, well, special black holes with the charge and so on. But then uh, another development came where people also um, discovered that by zooming in near these horizons, you can have very special space times that occur uh, where we also have a description in this holographic language where everything is sort of happening on the, on the boundary. This is called ADS-CFT. And it's in that context that also people have computed quantities related to entanglement entropy and so on. And they found a beautiful uh, correspondence again that the entanglement entropy is exactly measured by the area of certain horizons. And also in that context, people have re-derived Einstein's equations and so on. Uh, but as you mentioned, I mean, many people saw this sort of as a, a duality, a kind of an equivalence. But my feeling is, and that's partly, I think, due to the work I, I've been doing, that the, the, the idea is shifting towards that, that the gravity is really the emergence part from the more microscopic description of the theory that lives on the boundary. People no, now use this language also. They say that the microscopic theory is the one that lives on the boundary, and then the space-time and that sort of merging in a kind of in this holographic direction 
is really just yeah indeed derived from the, the the boundary theory. So the you have this image indeed of the world described by something that lives on the boundary, and you have to then try to reconstruct what's inside, like like what you do with the hologram. Mm -hmm. And um, so there uh, we have I think now a very good understanding of gravity, but it, unfortunately it's in a, in a universe that we don't live in because it's a universe that actually has a negative uh, cosmological constant, so it doesn't have the dark energy that we have seen in our universe. So we're we're doing well, made a lot of progress in in that area, but there we do also know quite well what the microscopic theory is. And we have found also this link with with the quantum information, um, but the 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 actual puzzle and the big questions are about about can we find a similar theory uh, for for a universe that looks more like our own, where we have an expanding universe and and where we actually don't understand where there is a boundary or whether there's a boundary. I think there most people agree there's no boundary. So how would you even formulate such a holographic theory of, of quantum gravity in, in a universe like our own? And uh, so I think this is where, 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 where the, the unanswered questions are, where people don't know how to do this. And actually in that context, people have not yet even found a good derivation of uh, Einstein's equations yet. <laughs> so there since we also don't know the microscopic theory i don't think we fully understand even how or maybe even whether we can derive Einstein's equations okay so just to sum it up you mentioned the string theory and a few results that appeared in string theory uh, uh like uh, i guess you were referring to the computation by strominger and buffer right the, i guess 99 right, yes. for black hole uh, entropy from fundamental principle or at least fundamental objects in string theory then ADS-CFT just to make it clear ADS-CFT is a an actual correspondence that appeared in the 90s uh, between uh, a d-dimensional theory of gravity and a d minus one dimensional theory living on its boundary with given symmetries the problem is that we have a lot of control on this I mean that depends who, who you ask but in general we have a lot of control on this and the problem is that a universe is not of the kind we have inside this object, right? It is not this kind of d-dimensional space-time. There's a constant called the cosmological constant, which is positive in a universe and negative there. So you're saying there's uh, an ongoing effort uh, in formulating the same kind of uh, framework or duality or correspondence uh, in a universe with a positive cosmological constant, right? Which we call it the sitter in physics. This is what you're saying? Yes. Okay. So in the sitter space, so ADS CFT is the name for anti de sitter uh, conformal field theory. So the conformal field theory is the quantum theory that lives on its boundary. And anti sort of means indeed that the, the sign of the cosmological constant is different. Yes. And, and our universe looks more like the sitter space because it has this positive cosmological constant. Now, the sitter space is also very interesting in the sense that. It doesn't have a boundary like um, anti de sitter space. anti de sitter space, you can almost think about like a sort of a soup can where you're living on the boundary and that inside of the soup can is where the space time is sitting. Uh, the sitter space actually is more like uh, our universe, namely it expands. Uh, and it, uh, if you think about the expanding universe, uh, uh, in our universe, things that are moving away from us actually move faster away when they're further out. We call this the Hubble expansion. The Hubble law tells us that indeed the velocity increases with distance. So there's a certain distance where where even things start moving away from us with the speed of light. Mm -hmm. So anything that moves faster from us with the speed of light would not be we would not be able to well send signals to it, mm -hmm. and it cannot even send signals to us. And so that that creates a horizon. In, in an expanding universe, which we call the cosmological horizon. And it turns out that, that that horizon has, again, the same properties as black hole horizons. It has also a temperature. It has also an entropy. Mm -hmm. So I think about our, our universe almost as the inside of a black hole, almost like, like, like we are living inside a horizon. Mm -hmm. Which is reversed and, and with respect to the black hole one. Reversed, right? because it's the upside down, because now the horizon is on the outside and we're looking towards it. But but we we're we're inside and so for a black hole you look from the outside towards the black hole, 
and you don't see anything that's inside now we cannot see anything that's outside our universe this is if it, the universe would be purely uh, the sitter space which is actually a universe where there's only what we call now dark energy which gives rise to that uh, positive cosmological constant so it's an empty universe but it still has a horizon and um and then this additional energy that we didn't find in anti sitter space we have sort of then also given our space time a temperature so i think about the sitter space as a space with a temperature and an entropy and so it has also all these thermodynamic properties that that we know about thermodynamic systems well, in anti sitter space, if there's no matter, the temperature would be zero. There would be no entropy. So it's a very dull state. It's namely it's just basically nothing there. It's just the vacuum. Well, in, in the sitter space, it appears that the vacuum is much more interesting because it contains this positive energy. It also has an entropy and it has a temperature. And, and we still have to try and understand that because for black holes, we have this theory of, well, Vava and Stromach should have explained for us how these things sort of can be explained microscopically. But for the sitter space, we don't have this microscopic theory yet. So, yeah, we are still having trouble understanding um, those kind of space times. Well, uh, let me... Uh... Let me comment on a brief point because I've been on YouTube for a while. So I'm sure this will appear in the comments afterwards. When you said that in the sitter space, I, I mean, we can think of the sitter as some inflating object in substance, right? So the further two points are, the faster they, are they appear to move away from each other, right? Because space time between them yeah. inflates, right? Uh, this does not, and if we are far enough, uh, it looks like we're moving apart faster than the speed of light. This has nothing to do with special relativity, right? Because people tend to ask this question, right? But does this violate special relativity? No, not at all. We're there. We are talking about local velocities in space time. Here we are talking about an effect that really kind of mimics the fact we are moving um, apart from each other faster than the speed of light, but it's highly non-local and it, it's perfectly consistent with special relativity. Just wanted to say yeah. that this comment would have appeared. So you're saying that this expansion generates an effective horizon or some kind of cosmological horizon, as we call it. And that behaves precisely yes. as a reverse black hole horizon, right? So you expect a space yes. to uh, behave that way. Okay, this is super interesting in, in a sense. This is one of the very, I mean, most fascinating ways in which the quantum gravity problem is tackled in, from my perspective. But let me kind of shift to the side a bit and ask a question which uh, uh, which might be of interest. Uh, given your uh, emergent entropic gravity proposal and this kind of a perspective, uh, I I'm not uh, asking for actual results. You might have them, but uh, uh, what do you expect the most natural phenomenological implications to be? Like, where do you expect signals of this kind of entropic or emergent nature to be found? Like, I'm not asking you to design a, a, a full-fledged experiment, just some hint. No, but, I, okay, that's a, a very good question. And, and and I have ideas about it, but not the full theory, I have to say. But I what I find fascinating is that uh, in, in the sitter space, um, as I said, we don't have a full theory yet of how to derive the loss of... Um, or, or even the equations of Einstein. Uh, but I think that that uh, the fact that we are then having a, a space time that has itself an entropy and already a temperature might actually make the, the whole derivation somewhat more, well, different from what it is in, in these other space times. And, and what I do hope is that, that when we start um, understanding how we derive these laws of gra gravity, in a universe like our own with dark energy and with this entropy and a temperature that there might be slight deviations from the laws of newton or and of of uh, of einstein i mean newton's law are kind of contained in einstein's laws if you think about it for 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 this very weak gravitational force and so on newton's law are derived from what well, derivable from from general relativity uh, and and of course, normally when we think about uh, a, a next theory in, in theoretical physics, usually the old theories sort of contained in it. 
But there are also situations when when the old theory fails. I mean, like in in, in Newton's case, it was uh, the perihelion shift of uh, Mercury where we found deviations. And so the question is, is, are there also deviations maybe from from general relativity that can be uh, observed that are the consequence of the emergent nature of 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 gravity? And I, I think that actually in the cosmological situation, we have many questions that we don't fully understand. And, and well, it's even a natural place to look at because what is cosmology? Because cosmology is concerned with how, where does space time come from? How did it begin and what was its origin? But also how we understand the, the bigger space with everything in it, like the dark energy and so on. And, and I think that there the emergent law of gravity, the emergent perspective on the laws of gravity actually can give yeah. us hints of, um, well, what is dark energy maybe? What is maybe what we're observing? Namely, are deviations from the the, the laws of um, Newton and, and, and Einstein that have to do with how galaxies behave. Now we have ways of sort of filling in those gaps by, by assuming that there's dark matter I mean, people see generally these deviations as evidence that there must be more matter in there. But I think that might actually be something that we might explain in a different way if we understand the, the laws of emergent gravity. And I hope that actually that um, turns out to be true because then we have plenty of ways of trying to make experiments because then, then we can observe these phenomena in cosmology. There may also be ways in which... Um, Emergent gravity kind of influences how we think about the early, very early universe, where we have some problems now. Also, for instance, people don't fully understand the way that the Hubble constant can be sort of measured now and how it compared to what happens in the early universe. So I hope, anyway, for me, always the, the best way to look at it is is in in um, is in cosmology. Um, I have to say there are maybe some other ideas that that are connected to maybe fluctuations that may happen in space time. This is sort of this generally what you think that uh, gravity, quantum gravity is about because quantum effects are fluctuations. And um, so if if space time itself is really quantum mechanical, you might try to look for for quantum fluctuations that happen at a certain scale. Uh, if it happens to be the case that well, normally we think that quantum mechanics and gravity is only important at the Planck scale, which is a very, very tiny scale, like it's 10 to the minus 32 centimeters, I think, if I'm saying this correctly. But anyway, it's much smaller than we can ever measure or even imagine. But yes. maybe these quantum effects can be more, more important if we look at uh, also, well, bigger scales that they kind of accumulate. Anyway, that is uh, also speculation that I think might be kind of looked for. But my hope eventually is that emergent gravity gets tested in, in uh, these other areas that I mentioned in cosmology. So that's my, my current uh, bet, at least, that that's where we can find evidence of this theory. So on one side, you expect effects might emerge in, uh, emerge in um, uh, for instance, interferometers, right? With a big enough interferometer, you might expect... Uh, statistical noise or quantum fluctuations to accumulate and introduce some effect in our measurements. Is that yes. with the latter perspective? And I, I, well, I see that as a kind of independent idea from what I explained for of, of cosmology and so on. But uh, it's true that that uh, those op those possibilities are there. Uh, but if you ask about specifically the emergence of gravity, I think the that I would bet more on the cosmological observations that I mentioned in the beginning. And that's why I, I wanted to deal with that one first and then move to cosmology, because uh, and in particular to galaxies. Because as you said, we observe galaxies, their rotation velocity. And we it that does doesn't really check with what we obtain from general relativity. And people usually expect this to be due to the presence of some matter that we cannot observe directly, maybe because it doesn't interact with light. So that's why it's called the dark, typically, which but there are other options, right? In literature, ad hoc solutions. For instance, what people refer to as modified Newtonian dynamics, like MOND. In MOND theories, you take your equations like Newton's law, that's enough, add some terms by hand. Mm -hmm. 
this is rough and explain this or at least model this by adding terms. Yes. Uh, rephrasing what you said, do you expect just to say, just to see if I understood correctly, uh, do you expect some kind of mond dynamics, some kind of mond effect to be derived in the end from emergent gravity? That's like right. So that properly you derive yeah. something like mond. Yes, I, I, I think that that I have to admit that first, just the idea of changing a law by adding some terms, I, I think that's usually not the way that we find new uh, laws or new theories of nature, because somehow Einstein didn't do also just writing some extra terms in, in Newton's theory. Um, but what I learned is that from uh, well, what, what Milgram is the one who, who is the person that proposed this modified Newtonian dynamics, what he observed is that um, the changes that we see in the rotations of stars in, in galaxies, the rotation curves, uh, appear when the gravitational acceleration reaches a certain value, uh, like a, a critical value, a threshold value. And and it turns out, and this is kind of the magic, is that that, that same acceleration is also the same acceleration that we measure at our cosmological horizon. So I mentioned this temperature that we are seeing being related to an acceleration. That same acceleration we see appearing in those, those um, galaxy rotation curves. So when I learned about that, then I thought there might be actually some connection because I think this dark energy that is present in our universe is really, really everywhere in space. And it actually is the source of the entropy that we also see. I think the really about the sitter space as a space time, which has entropy and temperature, not just at the horizon, but actually basically filling our, our space time. And that what we are see, observing in these galaxy rotation curves is sort of the interaction between the matter that makes the, 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 the galaxies and the stars with this dark energy that's present. And the uh, interaction might be effectively described by this mont, uh, this modified Newtonian dynamics equations. So I don't think of it as just a, a change of the law of Newton like like they do. I think it's really just uh, an, another effect that may be phenomenologically described by those equations. Because I do think that what, what Milgram did is more like a fitting of the data that works very nicely by this formula but eventually we need to explain this form formula microscopically from this underlying theory but as i already mentioned we don't have a microscopic theory of the sitter space yet but once we have it we might try to derive again the gravitational laws and look for those deviations from general relativity and then we may observe maybe that they behave exactly like this modified uh, newtonian dynamics and then we have uh, really found evidence, I find, for our theory, because we can then, well, maybe even make predictions that we don't know about yet and start measuring them, because those observations are, are really possible, because they don't require us to build very high, um, well, energy accelerators or, or, or indeed doing measurements at, at very, very tiny scales. There, there are cosmological observations that we can use then to test our theory. Well, that's extremely interesting. Like th th this is precisely what I was referring to. Like, okay, mond is some kind of fit. I I defined it as a phenomenological model, but yeah, it's more or less a fit. But being able to derive this from first principles would be a natural way to try to address the problem. And then it's clear you could make like predictions of the form a galaxy such and such should rotate at this speed, and a galaxy such and such, and that's perfectly within uh, experimental reach, which for a, a young PhD student working in quantum gravity is absolutely amazing in the sense that <laughs> being able okay. to test it directly is really interesting. But I promised you this would have not lasted much more than one hour because I tend to go on and try and keep asking questions. So if I may, uh, can I ask you a bit more personal question to conclude, which can be helpful for our students? Nothing extreme, right? But are, are you there or? Uh, I okay. think we had a glitch. I, th I, I think, think there was a glitch. glitch. Yes, but yeah. we're here. Where did you? Where did you lose me? Like, 
Well, you said that you would go on for an hour, but that's sort of where you need stopped. So I thought there was maybe some time clock that you had to put in the hour. <laughs> yes. No, 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 no. I don't know what happened, but I just want I, I was just saying that uh, I would go on and on, but I promise you this wouldn't, I mean, there's some kind of time frame. So I would like to move to a more personal question, if you may, uh, which can be helpful. Nothing extreme to all okay. the listening to us. Uh, why? Because you said you were interested in quantum gravity and all that, but why do you find quantum gravity in particular to be disinterested? Interesting. Like, why do you like the problem of quantum gravity? Not, for example, like superconductors or whatever other problem. Like, what's special in quantum gravity that attracts you? Well, I, I do think that, that um well, gravity having its connection with space time and geometry, but also the quantum aspect of it, I think is sort of what motivates me from the beginning. Uh, I think the questions are very fundamental. And I always had the feeling that that uh, since the discovery of Hawking, um, that that we would discover, discover something very fundamental that may even change the way we think about cosmology. I mean, it's the fundamental nature of those questions, of course, that... that um, drives me but also maybe a slight unhappiness with a certain way we now think about things like the origin of the universe to be honest i find it very hard to think about uh, the, the the standard picture that there might be something nothing there and then suddenly it explodes and, and it gives rise to the entire universe i find an unsatisfactory uh way of describing um well, the beginning of, of space and time. So I think emergence is a more subtle way of doing it because you might say there was always something there, but then the space-time emerged from that. But I, I really hope that our theory eventually starts, um, well, working in the same way that other theories have been in the past. And they eventually when we understand that we might start making predictions and, and making even measurements. And having done that for gravity and 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 maybe the more fundamental questions associated with that is what really what drives me and I find very fascinating. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure this will be of great help. And thank you for your time, for accepting our invitation. And I hope this was as nice for you as it was for me. Okay, good. <laughs> it was a pleasure being and uh, talking to you and I enjoyed it as well. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.